Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Veronica Sansa. I'm one of the co-founders of Commerce Next. Commerce Next is a community event series and conference for marketers at retail and direct to consumer brands. On behalf of my co-founders, Scott Silverman and Alan Dick, I wanna welcome you to this week's webinar. Our topic for today is how advanced customer insights can elevate marketing. Thank you for tuning in live. And for those that are watching later, thank you for watching the replay. This is a live event and we wanna make it as interactive as possible. So please make sure to tee up your questions. I'll show you how to do that in a minute. And be ready because we're gonna ask you questions as well via our live polls. We wanna get your insights. I wanna kick off with a few important thank yous. I first wanna thank our speakers, Vivian Wang, SVP of e-commerce at Anastasia Beverly Hills, Jamalia Cobine, VP of e-commerce and digital marketing at Ursa Major Skincare, Carrie Lawrence, CEO at Decile. Um, thank you for taking the time to share your insights with our community. We're really excited to partner with Decile on this webinar. They're gonna share their expertise on how to use customer insights for marketing. And then we're gonna have a panel on that same topic. Now I'm gonna quickly move over to the slides and just run through a couple of important announcements. So first of all, um, we're gonna take a hiatus after this webinar, but we'll be back in two weeks on September 9th at 2 p.m. with a webinar on how customer experience demands optimization at scale. Our speakers include Ning Gao from Verizon Group, um, Michael Scharf from Evolve Technologies, and our very own Alan Dick will be hosting this one. If you wanna register, you can sign up at bit.ly, CN Webinar 18. I also wanted to remind everyone that we have our Holiday Optimization su Summit. It's on October 7th from 1 to 4.30 Eastern, 10 to 1.30 p.m. Pacific time. Um, we're just asking you to save the date at this point. It's gonna be a great event and really help you make the most of a digital first holiday season. Now, a few housekeeping items, especially for those that are new to our webinars. Don't worry if you miss anything. We're recording this webinar and we'll make it available for replay tomorrow. I'm gonna show you where everything is on the screen. So first, if you have questions, um, there's a white panel box on the right. You can hit Q&A and you can ask your question in the bottom. We really want you to ask questions. And the way we know a question is important is if you upvote the question. So if someone else asked a question and you think it's relevant, make sure to upvote that question so that we can ask the panelists. Um, also, we have some handouts for you, including the slide deck, as well as some information from Decile and a special offer for webinar participants. Um, and you can find those handouts in the handouts tab on in the in the bright pen panel. And for those who are gonna be watching the replay, you can find the handouts in your player at the bottom of the screen. Now I'm excited to turn it over to Carrie Lawrence. She's gonna make the case for using customer insights and marketing. Carrie, if you wanna turn on your camera. All right, I'm gonna turn off my camera and have you go from here. All right, thanks so much, Veronica. I'm really glad to be joining this, this panel today for a topic that is near and dear to our hearts here at Decile. And for those of you who are not familiar with Decile, that is no big surprise. We actually were formerly known as the audience intelligence platform at Social Code, and we recently spun out to be our own separate entity. So at a high level, what is Decile? We're a customer data and analytics company. And what we're really trying to do is to help marketers, like a bunch of you who are hopefully joining us here today, to really leverage um, their customer data to help kind of extract those really important customer insights and business intelligence with ultimately with the goal of driving profitable growth. So I did wanna share just a couple of things. We have the benefit of working with quite a few clients, especially in the kind of e-commerce direct to consumer world. So I wanted to share some topics that I know are top of mind for a lot of our clients and probably a lot of you as well. So um, I'll go ahead and, and jump ahead. But one of the first things um, that I wanted to mention was as I, I'm sure everyone here knows, there's just a ton of complexity and increasingly so um, to manage your data. A lot of times, not only are, you know, are marketers having to worry about you know, where it's stored, how they gather it, but there's a lot of ecosystem changes happening as well. So I'm sure it is not a big surprise to those of you here 
that there are a lot of um, important browser privacy changes that are starting to take place. I think this all sort of kicked off, you know, um, coming off of the Cambridge Analytica scandal of a few years ago. And I think, you know, obviously, privacy um, and treating that data with the utmost care is, is, is hugely important, but also something that is impacting marketers in a pretty big way. So I'm sure you know that Google announced in February that Chrome will, they have plans to fully eliminate third-party cookies by 2022, so over the next two years. So they're sort of following the same footsteps of Safari and Firefox, but Chrome um, really owns 70% of usage um, for their browser on desktop, and I think it's about 40% in mobile. So certainly implications, um, challenges related to attribution, retargeting, potentially increased costs in those wall gardens. So certainly something that is that is top of mind. I think regulatory compliance, obviously, this has been a huge topic um, with sort of compliance kicking off in January of this year and July 1st um, sort of kicked off the, the end of the deadline for marketers to start to be um, compliant. So I think this is, um, it's definitely top of mind. I think that um, it's something that marketers need to think about as far as how they are managing those um, customer consent preferences um, from their customers. So there's there's a lot of talk too about not just in California, but you know other states following suit and to get getting having even stricter regulations. So certainly something to think about as it impacts performance. Um, and when we think about consent management, the way that Decile thinks of it is it's kind of the rubric we use is is inform, acquire, and apply. So obviously you as the marketer need to figure out how to inform customers of you know how they how their data is being used, how it's being leveraged. You need to figure out a way to acquire those customer con pre consent preferences. And then lastly, how do you apply those preferences at an individual person level into your marketing. So lots of things to consider um, with the complexity of managing that data. I think outside of that, there are, I mean, as everyone is aware, huge shifting um, external factors right now. So with the global pandemic, certainly this is having a huge impact on all businesses. And I think that uh, marketers are having to be even more religious about cash management and how Kind of they're thinking about kind of growing their business, scaling, um, scaling with customers, but also um, thinking about um, profitability as well. Um, remote working, there's you know a whole different way that individuals and people and families are are living these days, and they are dealing with things like how do we handle childcare? Uh, you know, the, this is a group of people who are just time starved, and they they might be thinking about you know, things that, that, that you think about while remote working are slightly different than in the office. Um, so um, related to that is just shifting consumer behaviors. So maybe your customers are more interested in lounge pants than they are with business casual apparel right now. So just, just understanding how those customers are changing. What are they interested in? Are they more price sensitive now? Are they buying different products for you? So there's definitely a need to leverage those insights to understand you know, how are these customers that you're acquiring now and during sort of this, this COVID era different from your evergreen customer? And so then there's obviously business realities and mandates that, that marketers need to be thinking about right now. And I think other big things that are happening directly, particularly um, with kind of uh, the, the more of the retail oriented marketers is, is channel mix changes and the need to quickly pivot um, between, for instance, you know, your offline um, stores versus your e-commerce strategies. And so someone who maybe only had 20% of their business running through e-commerce pre-COVID maybe quickly had to accelerate that and became 80% of their business. And then as stores start to open up again, maybe that starts to revert again. So there's definitely a need to be nimble and to be able to manage those, those channel mix changes. Um, and then certainly I think this has been something that's been accelerating over the last couple of years, but I think that there is a realization that it's not enough to just scale and grow and acquire customers just for the sake of acquiring customers. I think that, you know, you need to find those, those high value customers, those who are going to be repeat purchasers and really drive that lifetime value for your business. So the idea of, you know, moving beyond just, you know, cost per acquisition and thinking more about lifetime value. And I think what's, 
kind of central to all of this is the fact that your most valuable marketing asset that you're going to have is that first party customer data. And now more than ever, it is essential as you start to think about more identity based marketing initiatives. So one example I wanted to share was um, a case study. This is a direct to consumer skincare brand and an example of how they use customer insights in a really smart way to drive meaningful business impact. And I think that, um, you know, what you can see here, and it's we've sort of highlighted the impact on the row as a return on ad spend. And, and what they we're able to do is be really smart with their audience strategy. So taking that first party data, helping to sort of start out and define like, how do how did they think of um, their their highest lifetime value customers? So defining that being able to kind of segment your customer base by those high LTV customers, and then kind of using third party data to help add additional filters or qualifiers, for instance, so needing to have this this particular brand, um, you know, needed a certain household income threshold. So by leveraging the combination of these high LTV customers with that household income qualifier, they were able to just drive a lot more um, meaningful returns and, and find the right types of customers. So something that I think can be handled in a kind of crawl, walk, run way, but um, definitely a smart way to think about how to use those kind of insights um, and tools. And so the last thing I, I wanted to kind of just touch on before we kick over to the exciting stuff with the panel is kind of what we're here, what do marketers need today? So these are the common kind of discussions that, that our team is having with our clients. So, um, you know, first and foremost, and this is kind of exactly related to our panel topic today, but a really deep understanding of those customer interests and behaviors, particularly in like how those are changing kind of pre post COVID phase two COVID phase three, like it's just essential you know, you can't wait for sort of an annual update on who your customers are. You need to know who they are at every point in time. Um, the ability to understand both lifetime value and customer acquisition costs, not just overall with your whole customer base, but thinking about it by channel and by cohort. So really starting to understand whether it's by product, whether it's by gender, whether it's by, you know, Facebook versus Google, thinking about that from a more cohort based level. Um, and then have strategies for acquiring those high value customers. So I talked about the one um, that one of our clients used to find more of those high value customers. I think that's um, a great strategy. Omni-channel strategy. So how can you pivot quickly? Um, in the example of like your your marketing mix is, is changing quite a bit where you need to lean heavily into e-com if you're not already 100% there or how to, if you are reopening stores, how to then kind of start, start to balance that and pivot back. Um, and then, you know, understanding incrementality and incremental spending and, and balancing that with 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 gross profit. So a lot of conversations that I'm sure a lot of you are having um, yourselves. And I know that um, our panelists think about this quite a bit, too. So um, anyway, that's I just wanted to kind of share what we're seeing across the board and um, I'm excited to kick into the panel. Awesome. Thank you so much, Carrie. Um, and and I just want to kind of also remind you that that Desktop has a handout. They have a special offer for webinar participants, so make sure to grab that before you go today. Um, now we're going to bring you guys in. We have some fun polls to kind of get your perspective and just a, a temperature check from you on how you're doing from a um, customer insights point of view. Our first question is, where do you store your customer insights? So really interesting responses. Most people are storing it in a CRM. Um, but then the second biggest answer is somewhere else. So I'm actually curious where the somewhere else may be. Um, and about 23% are storing it in a CDP. Um, next question. How do you define your highest value customers? So the options are sales to date, purchase frequency, predictive LTV by revenue, predictive LTV by profitability. The most popular answer here is actually predictive LTV by revenue, followed by um, sales to date and purchase frequency. And then there's about 18% of people who are doing um, predictive LTV by profitability. So definitely, you know, I look, data is like a wall. We talked about it on our prep call that data is a crawl, walk, run kind of approach. And it seems like um, people are in different stages of the process, but definitely working towards it. The third question is, in the last year, how has your use of third-party data changed? 
the responses are increased, stayed the same, decreased, or don't use third-party data. For the majority of you, it looks like it stayed the same. Um, then some people don't use third-party data. Some people increase their use of third-party data. Very few people decreased it. Um, super interesting. And then our last question is really um, kind of to tee up our next webinar, which is all about optimization. So we want to know how many e-commerce experiments do you run each month? So by experiments, we mean A-B tests, but I guess, of course, it could be multivariate tests. And it ranges from none to 20 plus in terms of the options. So we're curious to see how much you guys are testing in terms of your e-commerce site. The majority of people are testing, but testing in smaller scales. I'm seeing right now one to five is winning. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna close this out. Um, it looks like the majority of people are, are testing, um, doing running one to five experiments. Um, some people are running no experiments, some people are running 20 plus, but it looks like it's more of, of a finite number. Awesome. Um, now we're going to kick off the panel portion. I'm going to ask the panelists to turn their cameras on. But I want to start by having each of you quickly introduce yourselves. Um, Jamalia, you're muted just so you know. So if you want to unmute yourself and, and go first, we'll go Jamalia, Vivian, and um, we've got a chance to meet Carrie earlier. So. Perfect. Thank you, Veronica. So my name is Jamalia Cobine. I'm the Vice President of E-Commerce and Digital Marketing for Ursa Major Skincare, which is an all-natural, clean skincare brand based out of Vermont here in the U.S. Um, check us out if you haven't already. My background is primarily in fashion and apparel retail leading up to this, so working with brands like Urban Outfitters and Topshop. Um, but I'm really excited to be leading the Ursa Major team, and I'm really pleased to be here today and speak with you. Thank you. Awesome. Vivian? Hi, everyone. My name is Vivian Wang. I lead digital and e-commerce for Anastasia Beverly Hills. We are a global makeup brand based uh, here in LA. Um, and prior to this, I've, I've spent the last seven, eight years in beauty. Prior to this, I was at L'Oreal uh, leading e-com and digital and, and very excited to be here. Awesome. Um, well, I'm excited for this conversation. And I wanna kind of start off with our first question to kind of mirror what we asked the, the audience in the polls. Um, you know, where do you store your customer insights? And Jamalia, I'll start with you. The audience at a whole mostly stored them in a CRM. Where do you sto store your insights? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, some small and mid-sized companies like Ursa Major, it doesn't necessarily make sense to invest in that standalone customer relationship management system. So we've sort of taken that path and the home of our customer record is really Shopify, which is obviously our website platform. And that in and of itself got us pretty far in our early years, but it didn't offer the level of insight and data that we really needed to kind of keep um, our business momentum going in the direction we wanted. So the past year we've made sort of a strategic decision about really where we want to invest. And specifically for us, it was leaning into um, a data science platform uh, that was really centered around our customer insights to better understand our customers. In our case, that is Decile. So we use Decile to really dig into those customer personas, segments, um, doing that deeper analysis on them so that we can not only power, you know, kind of marketing efforts like audiences for paid social, um, but also so we can power our internal decision making um, and our planning process. So this has been kind of unlocking a lot of customer information and data that we've had. So it's been a really great transition for us. Um, so, you know, to sort of summarize there, Shopify is really the home of that customer record um, as we don't have retail stores of our own, but we really take all of that data um, from Shopify and other systems like our ESP, Klaviyo, and we feed that into Decile as the home of our customer insights. Awesome. Vivian, where do you store your data? We are on um, we are on Salesforce Commerce Cloud and Marketing Cloud. So we effectively um, have built out. Uh, uh, as we collect additional consumer information, we build it out within Marketing Cloud. Um, and uh, and um, to, to Gemini's point, I think um, it's interesting because I would imagine that if you would ask that question and then also ask the question of what size company are you, there's a big correlation in terms of how different com size companies store their data. Um, 
for the earlier point, um, I was previously at, at L'Oreal and at L'Oreal, there was a, a large, um, very <laughs> intricate um, global infrastructure that housed customer data. And I think um, uh, what's important, we talked a little bit about this yesterday in the prep call is um, I think knowing that regardless of what stage um, in your um, in your segmentation journey you're in or how big you are, I think there's always something you can do. There's always a place that you can figure out how to um, store that data and use that data in a in a productive way, even if you don't have um, the uh, you know a, a large um, a large budget to make that investment. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and and you know it's baby steps. You you start in one place and and then you kind of grow from there. Um, so, you know, kind of getting a sense of where we store the data, maybe Vivian, I'll stay with you for a second. What metrics do you use to actually segment your customers? Sure. So when we started off um, a couple of years ago, uh, we started with, with just engagement, which I think is a, a common place for, for people to start. Um, so for example, when you think of emails, thinking of, um, of your um, customers in terms of when's the last time they opened an email, when's the last time they clicked on an email, s some level of, of being able to measure engagement with your brand and your messaging. Um, since then, we've introduced a number of different um, dimensions. Um, one is CLV, which I know we talked about in the poll, so customer lifetime value, um, which uh, uh, we kind of use as our, our North Star a little bit in terms of, of thinking through um, uh, you know, how much can we spend to acquire a new customer and and um, what do we think that customer is ultimately worth? Um, and then the other dimension um, that we also look at is category. Um, this is a little bit for us a proxy for profitability because for, for us, we, we play in four major categories, brow, eye, lip, and face. And each of those product categories has um, pretty different uh, margin profiles, product margin profiles. And so we almost use category as a, as a proxy for profitability, even though our CLV just looks at revenue. And then also it's a good um, indicator of um, what type of makeup consumer we're talking about. Someone who's buying brow from us uh, is, is not necessarily what we call a makeup junkie, someone who's obsessed with makeup, someone who buys one of our newest um, eyeshadow palettes probably is much more heavily interested in, in makeup and tutorials and, and um, really more that prosumer type of profile. Um, and then the last um, dimension that I want to talk about, we're just starting to test this out, is um, what we call occasion. Um, and um, for us, it's different than apparel. It's not occasion for when you wear the makeup, but it's occasion of why you would buy on our site. So we have um, launches, which make up a big percentage of our sales. Um, and again, it's a it's a makeup lover who comes to our site and has to get the product on, on launch day. So we have a set of consumers who come for launches. Those consumers are very different than a consumer who comes to our site for a promotion, for example, for Black Friday. And so we've started to segment consumers a little bit by the, the three big buckets are promo, launch, and core. Um, and uh, we found that even though it sounds simplistic, that tells us a lot about how and why a, a consumer comes to our site. Yeah. I mean, well, that makes a lot of sense, right? Because um, you know, you, when you start to see certain custom, certain products are more likely to re lead to repeat purchase, then you can you can predict the LTV of consumers if they're entering in by buying those certain products. Like it's, mm -hmm. it, it's a good signal for that predictive CLTV. So very smart. Um, and and in your case, because you also wholesale, how does that play into it? Yeah, we, um, so when we were in the beginning of our journey, the, the first year, we didn't really, we, we kind of looked at abh.com as um, almost like a silo, which we knew wasn't true, but it was, it kind of simplified our, our life. Um, and now we're really trying to pull in those insights in terms of how is that consumer shopping in the entire wholesale ecosystem. Um, Sephora and Ulta are our biggest um, wholesale partners. Um, so we do a couple of different things. Um, we just started sending out surveys to samples of our consumers on a regular basis to understand when a consumer buys from us, is it that her first time buying our brand? Is that her first time buying that category from us? Has she purchased again since she purchased from our site? And so it starts to paint a bigger picture and a, and a more holistic view of, of CLV even um, uh, that we can use to segment our customers. It's not perfect and we don't have it for everybody, um, but we do 
sample regularly to, to get a, a sense of what does that bigger picture look like. Awesome. Yeah, it's always tricky when, you, when you're in multiple channels to be able to kind of understand that full halo. Um, we're getting some great audience questions. Um, thank you all for, for putting questions in. I'm gonna pull one of the audience questions and Carrie, I hope it's okay for me to direct this one to you. Justin Booker asked, um, with, um, with these being very unpredictable times, you know, COVID, the election, should marketers take a different approach to customer insights? Um, and I guess as part of this, like the, the you know, customers are in a different mindset now. So I guess, like, do you do something different to segment your COVID acquired customers than you do the ones that you acquired before COVID? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question and something that we are actively helping our partners with. So we got so many questions from our clients about this that we started to create these kind of like pre-curated dashboards that were, here is your customer post COVID versus what that customer was a year ago at the same time or just the four months before COVID. So you could start to understand, again, it's helpful if you also have access in addition to all your first party data, having that additional third party data enrichment, because then you can also dig into like behaviors, how those are changing interests, et cetera. The other big area that we've started to lean into with, with a bunch of our clients is starting to think about all the different persona groups that you have within your customers. And we look at this a couple different ways. One of the ways is like not only understanding okay, where, where do your customers all fall in these different personas? But then how much revenue are you getting per each of these personas? So it's just kind of a different angle on the LTV, but like, so, you know, maybe your, um, you know, your evergreen shopper or your, your moms have a different profile than your kind of, you know, your urban elite or whatever those various uh, persona groups are. So I think, um, that's interesting. What we've seen a lot during COVID is we see that the more kind of community minded personas are starting to pop a lot more. I mean, that's not surprising given everything going on in the world and that, you know, especially with some of the, you know, the millennial generation too, just being very sort of community oriented um, and philanthropic. So I think we, I think it's important to also, in addition to looking at some of those, those hard kind of sales stats and understanding like, the different, you know, how I think product categories and Vivian alluded to some of this too, but like the types of products that customers are buying now when they're doing, you know, remote work or, you know, maybe watching their wallets a little bit more closely, it, it might be quite different. So we also see a lot of our clients are thinking about, okay, if we need to free up a bunch of cash right now, we need to get rid of our inventory. So maybe we wouldn't typically have a site wide sale. Um, one of the things that, that we're kind of helping them think through is maybe you don't need to offer the site-wide sale to all of your customers. Maybe you figure out, you know, which ones are more kind of price sensitive and discount oriented, and then you can like kind of target an offer towards them. So um, anyway, long story short, yes, I think, as I said in, earlier, it's, it's more important than ever to have a quick pulse on how those behaviors are changing. So the closer you can get to understanding that, the better. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and especially like all of us who've probably had moments where we're searching every possible e-commerce site for disinfectant wipes. It doesn't necessarily mean customer loyalty, it's just customer loyalty for disinfectant wipes. So you you kind of have to read the signals a little bit more. Um, Carrie, and while I have you, um, you know, we we surveyed the audience about the highest value customers. Um, the big, the top answer that this community had was LTV by revenue. How do your customers um, define highest value? What do they use? I think that's right. I mean, that's consistent with what I would say most of our clients, how they're defining those high value customers. It's either, you know, frequency of purchase is another one, but like definitely LTV um, by revenue. I would say as you get to the the run portion of the crawl walk run starting to, and I think both Vivian and Jamali sort of alluded to this too, like sometimes like it sounds like Anastasia thinks about it from a product category level. They know which of their products have the higher margins and can think of it that way. Um, I would say, so thinking about it from the product level, um, from a loyalty level, if you have a loyalty program, that can often um, indicate to kind of your point about the, the Clorox wipes, you know, like you you want those people who are really going to be loyal, kind of continue, continuous customers, not just one time. Um, we also have um, some clients who... Think about it, um, again, just from like profitability by SKU, they think about propensity to purchase is another interesting way to also think about segmenting your customers. So if you have access to any kind of data science, whether it's in-house or through a partner, 
um, being able to understand not just um, kind of the revenue to date, but who has the highest propensity to purchase in the near term. Awesome. Thank you. And that, that makes a lot of sense, whether it's ranging from kind of who they are, or what they purchased. And actually, Carrie, I'm going to ask you Doug's question because he um, he asked, how does how has the use of first party data changed? Um, and in his case, I guess he it increased. Are you seeing that as well, um, kind of given the, these COVID times? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think it's not just COVID, but uh, like all the regulatory changes, all the browser changes, there's just like, it's so important to, un you know, that is going to be your most valuable marketing asset. That's my pure belief. And the more that you can grow that first party customer data set, the better, because you're going to start to lose the ability to have more of that third party data. And so, you know, it's, it's certainly been a shift, I think, from more just kind of um, behavioral or contextual into more of identity based marketing. So I think um, there's definitely a shift there. It also allows you to manage things like those customer consent preferences, right? Like if you don't have first party data, you don't know how you know your customers want to be talked to or addressed. It just makes it a little bit more challenging to market to them in the way that they want to be marketed to. So it's like it's very important to kind of meet your customers where they are. Yeah. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Um, Vivian, have you seen um, how has your use of first party data changed? Any any other thoughts on that one? I, I would echo what Carrie said. I don't think that um, our use of first party data has changed per se because of COVID. I think it's just a general continuous trend of, you know, understanding that data is equals, um, uh, you know, how well you know your consumer, how well you're going to be able to market to them, how well you're going to be able to drive revenue. So um, I think I've just seen a consistent upward trend um, from a, from an appetite to basically collect and use that data. Um, within, uh, within ABH and then also previously within L'Oreal, I think um, there's also been a bit of a journey from a mindset perspective in terms of of um, putting value on on data, um, because I think a lot of times you're collecting data, and it's hard to say, okay, we're going to make this investment um, in whatever it is—a guided selling tool, you know, some some um, uh, way to interact with the consumer, where you're maybe collecting really valuable pieces of information and you're storing that in the proper way so that you can use it for segmentation later. I think it's sometimes hard to put dollars on exactly what is that data worth. So I think there has been, um, at least in my experience, there's been a bit of a journey from a mindset perspective of um, understanding that that um, even if you can't put a direct ROI in terms of we're going to collect this data and next year we're going to add this much incremental revenue because of that, yeah. I think they're starting to be understanding that it, it feeds into lots of different things. It feeds into marketing, it feeds into paid marketing, email, it can feed into different parts of your business. Um, in ways that um, might not be a direct attributable. Yeah, and that's a good point. It, you know, we kind of um, focused on advertising, but once you understand your customers, you can also make your earned marketing much more effective because you can feed it back yeah. into your CRM or CDP and, and use it to, to better segment, whether it's running your, your site-wide sales to a specific segment or, um, or you know, being more targeted in the types of product categories that you offer customers. All of that makes a lot of sense. Um, awesome. And, um, you know, we, let, let's kind of double click on COVID a little bit because that seems to be a lot of interest from the audience. Um, Vivian, how, how has your audience strategy changed since COVID? I, I, what are you seeing? Yeah, we, um, I mean, in terms of how we've shifted, um, the way that we've looked at, at customer segments, I would say since COVID, we have focused a lot more on engagement versus um, versus uh, sales and CLP. Um, and this is just, I mean, if you take a step back, we know that this is a, a time that's difficult for our consumers. They're full of uncertainty. From a makeup perspective, um, you'd be surprised there are certain categories of makeup that are growing. But in general, people are using less makeup. We know that they're not going out as much. And so we have shifted um, a lot of our focus to engagement we are using as a proxy for how um, how interested that consumer is in our brand, even if she doesn't maybe she doesn't have um, the appetite to purchase right now. So I say that's kind of one one piece. Um, 
the second kind of new dimension that we've been we've been um, looking at, which I guess has always existed in the past, it's, just, it's become a little bit more important, is geography. Um, we're a global brand, our site serves um, almost the entire world. And so we have seen, um, obviously as the spread of COVID has changed in terms of intensity across different geographies, and then even within the US, we've seen um, uh, that beha behavior and sales change across um, across geography. So we've we've kind of added that into the lens of who are we talking to, even what tone of voice do we have when we're talking to different um, parts of the world uh, who may be, you know, at different parts of the curve in, in, in the COVID um, in the COVID journey. Yeah. Um, it's interesting that you said that, I mean, it makes sense that people are not going out so they don't wear as much cosmetics. Although all these Zoom calls, I feel like they create new sense of pressure for cosmetics in some ways. Well, it's, it's interesting. So actually, so brows has been up significantly. Uh, and I feel like it actually makes sense if you're at home and you don't want to put on a full face of makeup. Brows are one thing that you can do that kind of look polished and, you know, you're on your Zoom call. Um, and we've actually seen um, lip, I guess lipstick would be great for Zoom calls, but um, because of masks, we've, we've seen lipstick decline. So it's actually been kind of interesting to, to understand like the specific COVID um, uh uh, effects on on the different categories that we sell. Yeah, my, my husband calls it like putting on your helmet. So like if I actually put on like makeup and like decent clothes, he's like, oh, I see you're putting on your helmet. <laughs> a lot of Zoom calls. Um, Jamali, are you seeing any differences um, since you're with, with skincare? It's a little bit of a different kind of need than than cosmetics. Yeah, you know, it's interesting in skincare, especially sort of early on um, when, you know, so many major cities in the U.S. were really on 100 percent lockdown. We actually started to see a huge uptick in interest and traffic and ultimately sales from that. And I think it was really that people were looking for something that they could do at home that was sort of a stress reliever and a way to kind of take care of themselves, um, knowing that so many of our customers are in major metropolitan areas, they're locked in their apartments. Um, so we really saw, you know, sort of that shift. And I would say we didn't really modify strategy. What we did uh, from like a targeting perspective, what we did is really think about um, similar to what Vivian said, being really sensitive to what's going on in people's lives and trying to make sure that we sort of stood for our own company values and how we were marketing to people during that time period and how we were interacting with our customers. And it really resonated with them. And, um, you know, from a business perspective, it was sort of a really strong time. And then from more of a, a coalescing with your customer base perspective, it was uh, a really great opportunity for us to sort of connect on a values basis versus just a, a selling basis. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, consumers are, mul are multidimensional from that perspective. Um, what let's let's kind of Jamal, I want to stay with you for a second. I want to I would love to understand how you're using your customer insights in, in advertising specifically. Um, you know, how are you targeting customers? You know, have you what have, what have you done to modify creative in response to the crisis? Yeah. Talk Absolutely. So, you know, for Ursa Major, we're using insights for our advertising and it's sort of a multi-step journey um, because we're really a brand led company. So, you know, first off, we're developing a deeper understanding of our customers and what they're interested in really by looking at areas where we, from a data perspective, kind of over index. So that might be um, activities like uh, hiking, for example, is something that that our customers over index on. And right now that's a little bit more aspirational. And so that we sort of play that out in the marketing, but it is kind of core to who who some of our, our major customer segments are. So in that aspirational sense, we then sort of look at who's our brand and our aspirational customer and where does that marry up with some of those activities um, we have a lot of natural ingredients. We consider the outdoors to be sort of a, a healthy step in in skincare and and in like kind of a daily routine. So for us, finding an over index in something like hiking and then matching that with really our brand personas from an aspirational perspective, that's when we know like we sort of hit on something. Um, and specifically with that, we've really used that to create um, outdoor focused segments in terms of audience segmentation for our paid social advertising. And that was really kind of a no brainer for us. And we're kind of delving down that path into more and more of these sort of activity based or interest based 
um, potentials that match up with our brand for, for really sort of targeted advertising. You know, from a creative perspective, uh, that's where that brand aspect is so important for it to come in and balance out with the data. Um, Cause if we found that tons of our customers were into race car driving, that's a really hard sell. Race car driving is super cool, but it doesn't really match up with sort of natural skincare and getting outside, right? So we're really making sure that we have that sort of perfect lockstep with the data and, and on our customers and with the brand is who we are. Um, so for our outdoor focused audience, we have a lot of visuals that are really about bringing the outdoors in and the aromas of our products. And from a creative perspective, that's sort of how that plays out for us. Um, and obviously, you know, kind of understanding those insights to, to better utilize that, that creative well, brand. Oh, yeah. How did you figure that out? Like, wh where did you find, you know, I, I, I get kind of natural product, but where did you find like our customers like hiking? Like, where did you, was that a research insight that you then layered on to your first party data? Or were you somehow mining that data point? Yeah, that's a really great question. So if you'd asked me that a couple of years ago, um, what we would have been doing is surveying our customers, um, really, you know, sort of letter from the founder style, surveying our customer base to understand what their interests are. And so we had a sense that, you know, the outdoors, things like hiking, fitness, these were all important to our customer base. More recently in the last year, um, as we've been using the Decile platform for uh, data science and data insights, we can actually see where we over index um, on a number of areas, things, um, everything from sort of interest based areas to more demographic based areas. Awesome. That's cool. So then, so in theory, you could then use different interests in a similar way. It could be hiking, it might be, I don't know, kayaking, whatever, and, and kind of find different ways to kind of affiliate. Very cool. Um, and, and, and then, you know, knowing that you can make creative that reflects those, the lifestyle of those, of those um, audiences. Vivian, anything to add to that quite on that point in terms of, you know, on how you're using your insights to, to actually market, is it all product based or are you layering on any lifestyle? We, um, yeah, it's, we actually have an interesting, um, almost dichotomy in our brand because the, the brand started by Anastasia herself started with eyebrows and it was really aimed towards, um, I'll call it the lady who lunches, the, the, the Beverly Hills lady who lunches. Um, so it was a little bit of an older consumer. It was someone who wanted polished brows without having to go to the salon. Since then, the brand has introduced a number of, um, probably the most innovative products in, in makeup, um, contour, I mean, but a heavy, a very different look, a very heavy um, makeup look. And a lot of those, those products were launched by Anastasia's daughter, Claudia. So we almost have uh, two different um, uh, sides of the brand. One is a much um, lighter makeup look that's about being polished and almost uh, I wouldn't call it a no makeup makeup look, but it's 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 lighter. And then there's one that's that's a bit heavier. So it, we already know before we kind of look at any consumer insights that we have two different consumers we need to talk to her differently. Um, and it, it gets quite interesting because, you know, there, there is some overlap also with with those consumer groups um, in terms of thinking about how do we message to these two um, kind of groups. We do it a lot through, and it comes from the top because Claudia is our creative director. She she shoots everything um, that we use in terms of of assets. Um, but if you look at our marketing, and I hope <laughs> I hope we do a good job segmenting so that we don't seem um, all over the place. But uh, when we're when we're talking about um, certain products and certain launches and talking to a certain type of consumer who's more of a makeup junkie, it is a heavier look. We use certain types of models. Um, uh, it's it's different music. I mean, it, it, it almost looks like a, almost a sub brand of the overall Anastasia brand. When we talk about brows, it, even just the word choices that we use in, in the copy, um, talk about, a you know, a slightly, um, uh, it's a, actually not slightly, it's a different, it's almost like a different, um, message. Um, so we, this is, that's kind of one piece that's, a bit unique to ABH, but I think a lot of brands have often when you get to a certain size, you start going after different segments that might almost seem at odds with each other. Um, and, uh, and yeah, in terms of marketing and emails and, and on-site is probably the hardest where, where it becomes a little bit harder to kind of separate those two, um, those two personas and those two stories. 
Awesome. That's great. I want to just quickly remind the audience, please make sure if you have any questions for the panel, um, load them up in the Q&A section. We'd love to hear your questions. Um, Carrie, I'm going to ask you a question about third party data. Um, if you can share, you know, how are how do your customers leverage third party data? I know that's something some customers, are, some brands are doing that. Some brands aren't. You know, you're the expert here. How are your customers leveraging third party data in their marketing? Yeah, no, it's it's a great question, and it's it's interesting. One of the things that we try to do at Decile is to make those kind of like interest, behavioral, psychographic insights more accessible to a smaller marketer. It used to be that like you had to be like a huge, you know, Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 brand to be able to like afford to buy, you know, have a direct partnership with a third party data provider. And like once Facebook and the platform started to remove that targeting capability, it became a little bit more challenging. Now, I would say there's two main use cases that our clients are really using with third party data. One is what we would refer to is is ID enrichment. So really just taking their customer data and then matching that what we would call a match key. So if we have you know, your email address and then we also have that email address match from a third party partner, then we're able to tell a lot of additional information. So that's kind of the use case for insights and then also analytics. So being able to, like we've talked a lot about segmentation and stuff. So you can, you can not only you know, use that third party data for insights, but you you might want to filter or create a segment that is, um, you know, in the in the case of Vivian, you want maybe the the younger, you know, you can segment out your younger women or the heavier makeup people, and then maybe they also have an interest in, you know, arts or culture or you know whatever those kind of third party interests are. So that that is um, the number one use case. So for kind of in, insights, analytics, enrichment. The second use case is. For, from a prospecting standpoint. So in, in this case, you do end up um, incurring additional fees, which is important to take into account. But if let's say you don't have a lot of first party data and you want to go after known you know, skincare purchasers or known um, eyebrow purchasers, or <laughs> sorry, the, the right terminology, but um, then you, would, you could go ahead and leverage third party data for what we would call pure prospecting. So you just kind of use that to kind of acquire more customers. It's all sort of in the pursuit, I think, what's important to note of building up your first party data asset. Cause like, it's great to use third party data for analytics and enrichment, but ultimately you wanna do that to be smarter about, you know, building up your own first party data set. That makes a lot of sense. Um, the there's, there's limitations to it, but together the two, the first party and the third party data are a lot more powerful. Um, we have a question from Riz Syed, um, and I'm gonna direct it to Jabalia first, as many organizations fail to extract value from their customer data, how do the teams work together um, uh, to, for data collection like CRM, web behavior, to ID resolution, to analysis and insight generation? In other words, you know, how are you getting all of the data in one place so that you can actually use it? Yeah, so you know, I, I feel like I sound a little bit like a broken record, but we do feed all of our data sources ultimately into the Decile platform. And so from a consumer insight, like or I should say customer insight perspective, that is really the home of that. Um, in terms of other insights, for example, if we do A-B testing um, on our e-commerce platform, that's really going to be a little bit more behavioral. Uh, it's less about sort of consumer insights and, and, and that analysis of, of our customer. It's a bit more of that customer behavior in the moment, and that's a bit more transactional. So honestly, that's the kind of thing that uh, we as a company, we're a small company. We're just over 20 people. Uh, we meet regularly, we share those insights, uh, we share them across the team. We really take an approach internally of a lot of data transparency, and we're not a highly layered company. So where, you know, at some larger companies, you may have things that are sort of only for the eyes of a director level or a VP level. Um, we really think that, you know, the most that we can do for our, our employees is to give them access, right? And to share that information out. So we have a lot of information transparency. Um, across our business. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, that, that's great. And Vivian, have you any anything to add to that one? I would just say that we, uh, so it's, it's interesting because um, digital owns that customer database, um, but we work really, really closely with, with 
uh, marketing. And I think to echo Jamalia's point, we try not to keep things in a silo and like hoard information so that it's living within e-commerce, even though we are the touch point with the consumer. So we're gathering this data. I think um, where where we have found great unlocks is when we're sharing this data out. And sometimes you don't even know exactly what the endpoint is, but if you share it out with sales and you share it out with marketing and with operations, people will have questions and you can kind of think together on, on how to make that data actionable. Um, I think it's actually a really important step in this journey because I think only when you can show that this data can unlock value for the entire business, not just the digital part of the business, that's when you get buy-in and support to continue to invest and, and build. Yeah, data democratization is 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 so huge, yeah. and actually, um, to to kind of gonna kind of keep going on audience questions um, really quickly, um, and actually, Carrie, since you just asked answered the question on third party data, Wuze Kim has a question about um, what are your recommendations for third party data sources that provide the most rich um, consumer insights? What have you found add the most value um, for in terms of third party data? Sure. I think it depends a lot on what vertical or what category you're in because, you know, there are certain providers. I mean, like Oracle Data Cloud owns, you know, CPG. I think, you know, Axiom is a, a partner of ours. That we, so we, par we partner with Axiom Experian, ODC, and IRI in different ways. But I think it's important to understand kind of what vertical you're in um, and then what's available. So, you know, Experian's known, they've got great like financial service and retail. Um, but what, what I would recommend is to try to find, you know, and not to be totally self-serving, it doesn't have to be decile, but I would try to find like a partner who can provide some of this like access of the third party data to you and manage a lot of those kind of partnerships and relationships just to simplify that process. But, um, anyway, so I hope that was helpful, but basically depending on what, what kind of vertical or category you're in, there's different partners, different strengths. Perfect. That's great. I think there's there's never a one size fits all answer. So, um, and and I'm sure Wuze, if you had additional questions or a, a specific type of third party data that you were looking to use, I'm sure Carrie could help you help guide you to the right place. Um, awesome. I'm going to close with one final question for Jamali and Carrie. Um, you know, what's one thing you optimized for recently that's helped you acquire more customers? Um, Jamali, do you want to start with that one? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, something that we hadn't had the opportunity to look into uh, that we now, you know, kind of with our with our data science platform are able to dig into is really understanding what the different products are as entry points into the brand. So I think this may be a little bit uh, have some similarity to what Vivian's talked about a bit in terms of sort of what your high margin products are in terms of the value. But for us, it was really like, all right, if your first purchase is a deodorant with us, how is that lifetime value different than your first purchase mm -hmm. as a face wash or as a face cream? And we really found um, that there was a huge variance in sort of how those different customer groups interacted over time with our brand. And what we've done is we've sort of extracted that information and really applied it to what products we use for advertising prospecting. Um, and that's been something that uh, we believe is going to be a bit of a, a game changer for us in terms of bringing in a high value customer and sort of upping our odds of, of finding those high value people or upping our odds of taking those people that are sort of a one-time purchaser and bringing them on to a, a sort of a second purchase or to discover more products in the brand. So that, that correlation between the lifetime value, uh, the repeat purchase, and what that first product that they purchased with us was is really interesting. And that's been, um, I think, one of the major things we've used to optimize recently. It sounds like that's almost like a, the first step if, if people, you know, want these, like maybe the second step, the first step is segmenting it based on spend, but then understanding what products it's tied to. I, I just, I vividly remember going to a conference and hearing the CEO of Fab, which kind of famously flared out. And this was before they flared out. He said, if I knew what I knew today, I would have marketed differently because they were like marketing a whole bunch of t-shirts and those t-shirts were low margin products and those customers only bought cheap products after that. And he's like, I realize mm -hmm. that I spend more to acquire customers who buy furniture, but those customers are so much more valuable to me. And so like, and this was many years ago. So now this is what we're talking about. And this is, um, commonly what people do, but it's such a big difference understanding how that entry point and the first product you sell customers 
will really reflect in their overall value that you get from them in the long term. Yeah, and I would just add to that, you know, we in the past had done sort of studies on this internally and we had crunched the information ourselves. And you get a really different picture when you can take 10 years of data and put it into a system that really sort of extracts those insights for you. So that was a really meaningful change for us. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Carrie, there was one question from Octavian Roscoe. I want to quickly ask you before we wrap up. Um, they're asking, what would you call advanced customer insights? Is it behavioral um, or micro granularity? Or is it a process of, of deeply understanding your customers? Or is it about building a framework to collect all the data? Um, they wanted to understand. Like, yeah. what would you consider? Is it all of the above? <laughs> I mean, it's certainly all of the above, and I think we've talked about this a lot. But you know, you can start with the crawl, you know, walk, run. I think the most advanced kind of expression of that is when you start to actually, you're not just looking at customer insights and thinking about it from a marketing standpoint, but actually starting to bridge also those financial analytics with marketing analytics. So then you start to really bring, we see this happening a lot, you know, the same way that our clients companies are starting to bring those two, and Vivian alluded to this a little bit too, but bringing together the, you know, financial or BI teams with the marketing teams. So when you can start to merge that data together and understand, you know, be able to answer questions like, okay, which of my cohorts are actually driving that higher lifetime value or which channel or answering questions like, Okay, if I want to, you know, achieve this much revenue, how many customers do I need to have? And which products do they need to be buying from? Or what is my payback period? So starting to take some of those more traditional like financial analytics views and bridging those with marketing. And to your point, Veronica, like really democratizing access to that data. Awesome. Well, ladies, thank you so much. I think this was a great discussion. By the number of questions the audience asked, I could tell everyone was really engaged. Um, just want to quickly remind everyone, um, we're on a bit of a hiatus for two weeks, but we're back in um, on September 9th, 2 p.m. webinar on why customer experience demands optimization at scale. Um, you'll be able to register for that right after this webinar, Bitly, CN Webinars 18. Um, and then our Holiday Optimization Summit is on October 7th at 1 p.m. Um, please save the date for that. We'd love to have you join us. I want to thank Vivian, Jamalia, and Carrie for joining us today, for sharing your insights, for answering all the audience questions. It was really fun. Thank you so much for being part of this. Thank you. Thank you. Take Bye. care. Bye. Bye.